It's hard work getting decent deep sky asteroid images from within or near the light bubble of a major city. Light pollution wreaks havoc on our images by reducing target contrast and producing unwanted background gradients. In this video, I'm going to give you my top eight tips that have really improved my images from my heavily light polluted backyard. So stay tuned and now watch my nerdy intro. I started this hobby from a Bortle 8 to 9 sky back when I lived uh, just one mile outside of Washington, D.C. I recently moved to the opposite side of the city to a Bortle 7 location, so it's slightly better. Uh, but my astrophotography experience has been almost exclusively in heavy light pollution. Along the way, I've learned a few tips, uh, tricks, and techniques that have really impacted my data and image quality. I want to share these with you. Uh, I'll start with some acquisition tips, talk about filters and mono versus one-shot color. Uh, then I'll end with a couple of things that you can do in PixInsight that really help with gradients. So enjoy. Tip number one, increase your total integration time. This might seem obvious, uh, but it's all that more important from a white or red zone. Uh, light pollution does more than cause gradients and noise in our images. It also obscures the target and decreases contrast. So to bring out more target signal uh, in detail, we've got to acquire more data than we would need to from a dark site. For example, on a relatively bright broadband target like M51 at F7 on my Edge 8, I would usually aim for about four hours of integration for luminance and then like an hour or so for each RGB filter. Uh, if I'm really going for a nice image, I'd, I'd go for even longer. Uh, but for one shot color on M51 uh, with the same telescope at F7, I'd probably aim for at least eight hours, considering one shot color is less efficient uh, with the Bayer matrix over the, uh, the Bayer array over top of the sensor. Um, now I'll talk about narrowband filters in a minute, but for broadband targets, uh, with a higher visual magnitude, which actually means less bright, um, so the, the dimmer targets, I would go with even more integration. Uh, you'll need to look at your stack uh, and signal to noise ratio levels to see if adding more time is necessary. Eventually, you may find that adding more time doesn't help. Um, you've hit the ceiling of what's possible from your particular sky and amount of light pollution. And that brings me to the next tip. So tip number two, pick reasonable targets. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. You need to choose acquirable targets from uh, your amount of light pollution. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the dust, uh, the dusty dark targets in Cepheus, such as the Dark Shark or the Seahorse Nebula, uh, but I'm also realistic about how difficult these objects are to image from light pollution. Since the dark dust objects are broadband, we can't use narrowband filters to effectively image them. Uh, and since they're dim targets, heavy light pollution essentially drowns them out. So while it may be possible to snag a decent image of these faint broadband targets with hours and hours of integration in heavy light pollution, it will probably be more efficient to drive a couple of hours to a much darker location and image from there in just one session. In my experience, the quality will be much better uh, with these particular targets from a dark location. And for the record, I'm talking about Bortle 5 and below. In a Bortle 8 or 9 sky, the quality of the dark dust images is going to suffer. Uh, I know from experience. Having said that, uh, there are numerous broadband targets that can fairly easily be imaged from heavily, uh, heavy light pollution, including M42, uh, the Horsehead and Flame Nebula, Andromeda, star clusters, galaxies like M51, 101, 106, 81, 82. There's a long list to choose from. Um, so be reasonable with your target selection, but also push the limit. See what's possible. Tip number three is the Horizon Discipline Tip. Um, you may have heard of this one as a general rule of asteroid imaging. It's pretty simple logic. 
the lower on the horizon your target is, the more atmosphere you have to peer through to see it. Uh, imaging low on the horizon further obscures your target. It bloats stars and details, blurs details. Uh, so how does this pertain to imaging in light pollution? Well, more than likely, your specific horizons from your backyard will have different levels of the light pollution in any given direction. For example, from my old house, uh, the light bubble was much more substantial in the southwest. So I would end my sequence before the target moved into the bright part of the bubble. From my new location, uh, the northeast is where the bubble is. So I try to avoid that area as well. Uh, learning to avoid uh, these worst parts of your sky uh, will pay off. Um, light pollution horizon discipline will improve your gradients and overall integration quality in terms of signal to noise ratio. Uh, unfortunately, it also limits your imaging zone, uh, but in my experience, it's well worth the trade-off. The difference between subs near zenith and subs in the bubble uh, is substantial. Tip number four, shorten your sub-exposure length. Uh, with the new CMOS technology, longer sub-exposures aren't really needed to swamp the read noise of your sensor. When you're imaging in heavy light pollution, uh, the photons from the light pollution are converted into electrons in each pixel of your sensor. Um, this can result in an increase in uh, background brightness. Uh, in fact, it always does. Uh, but also um, it reduces the contrast of your target. Uh, it's really easy to expose for too long in heavy light pollution because it can blow out the background and completely wash out the target. So it's best to find a sub exposure length that gives you a decent signal to noise ratio while minimizing background brightness. As an example, uh, go back to my Edge 8 at F7. Um, or even my RC8 at F8, I find that 120 second exposures work great for LRGB imaging. Uh, but if I'm using my refractor at F4.4, I reduce it down to 60 seconds. I don't see a need to go any further than that, and, and my images, my integrations come out just fine. Um, however, when you're imaging with narrowband filters, it's different. So let's segue into the next topic of using filters with a one-shot color camera. So nowadays there are tons of options on the market for dual and tri-band filters uh, for one-shot color cameras. These filters block out a majority of light pollution uh, and isolate a nebula's emissions in the H-alpha and O3 wavelengths. Um, they're designed to work with emission nebula. They do an excellent job of eliminating light pollution and creating much better contrast for those types of targets. Um, if you use these filters, you'll need to up your sub exposure length and probably gain. Um, so, uh, but for broadband, there are some broadband light pollution filters available in the market for one shot color. Uh, personally, I haven't found one that I like using. They always seem to mess with the color of the target uh, and there seems to be an overall loss of signal, uh, meaning even more integration time is necessary to reduce noise levels and to bring out detail. I find that when shooting broadband, uh, using no light pollution filter at all works just fine, uh, even in my Bortle 8 to 9 yard, um, especially when utilizing the techniques that I've mentioned so far in this video. However, when shooting a Mission Nebula with one shot color, the dual band filters are great. Uh, but perhaps the best way to image in heavy light pollution is to go mono, an image with show narrowband filters, uh, which is the next tip. So tip number six, uh, using a mono camera and show narrowband filters or SHO narrowband filters. Uh, this method limits you to imaging emission nebulae and utilizing a false color palette for your final image, but it's great. Some of the most beautiful images are produced this way, including images captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. So for those that don't know what a show image is, it's a combination of three data sets acquired using three different narrowband filters that capture specific emission lines of a target. So the S stands for ionized sulfur, 
Uh, H is hydrogen alpha and O is ionized oxygen. They are each assigned to an individual R, G, or B channel to create a colorful image. And they can be mix and matched using pixel math, for example. Um, so now if you are thinking about going mono and, and investing in filters, I highly recommend you purchase a narrow bandwidth filter set, especially if you are in Bortle 7 or higher. I find that my 3.5 nanometer set works very well at blocking the light pollution gradients and providing excellent contrast. But even at 3.5 nanometers, the O3 stack still shows fairly significant gradient. Uh, I used to own a set of seven nanometer filters and they just weren't cutting it. The stars were very bloated uh, and difficult to control uh, and there were gradients in every channel. So uh, I, I highly recommend getting the the more narrow, the better. Um, three nanometers seems to be pretty standard nowadays, especially from heavy light pollution. It's also worth uh, mentioning as a side note to this segment that I find it much easier to image broadband targets with my mono camera. Not only is it more efficient at acquiring photons, the gradients uh, are much easier to remove in the separate data channels. Um, I always found it more challenging to remove gradients with one-shot color cameras. So uh, I just, you know, as a side note, mono imaging with LRGB broadband targets, it's just easier. Um, so if you're currently using one shot color from heavy light pollution and you're frustrated, maybe it's time to take the plunge. Okay, tip number seven, uh, using local normalization during the pre-processing your sub-exposures. Um, this feature is now baked into the weighted batch pre-processing script in PixInsight. Essentially what it does is simplify gradients in your calibrated sub-exposures by making the data statistically compatible at the pixel level. Uh, so when you're taking sub-exposures from light pollution, as the target moves across the sky, your sub-exposures are going to have different brightness levels in the background. Um, if you've ever blinked your subs without applying uh, an STF to each channel, each individual frame, uh, rather, it's very obvious. You can see how the brightness level changes over time. Um, so local normalization uh, normalizes the background of each subframe using a reference image that's created from an integration of the best frames in your data set. Ultimately, what this does is it makes it easier for the background extraction process to remove gradients. I've got an example up on the computer for you to see here, so I'm going to move you over there real fast. Okay, so what I've got on the screen here uh, are two separate stacks. Uh, identical data, the one on the left uh, is with local normalization applied during pre-processing. The one on the right does not have local normalization applied. Uh, and When you just look at these, you can see a difference. Uh, first of all, you'll notice that the outer edges of the non-local normalization has dark and bright spots. That's pretty well taken care of here uh, with local normalization. So it definitely did its job. Um, also, you want to look at the K value down here. At the bottom, when I hover my mouse, you'll see it pop up. And if I just kind of scroll around, you can see what the K value is. And if I go to this side, you can see it's a bit higher. Uh, the next thing I did was a, a DBE. So here is the local normalization DBE. Did a pretty nice job. Here is the non-local normalization. Also did a nice job. You can still see the outer edges, uh, very bright or dark in those spots. Um, let's look at the background models it created. That should tell us something. Here it is for uh, local normalization. Here's the background model for non-local normalization. And you can see it looks like it's just a much more complex uh, background model that it had to create to, uh, to get this flat field. So uh, I would say uh, this is worth it. Um, you want to take care of as much of the gradient as you can before you even begin processing your image. Uh, it's definitely worth the extra time it takes during pre-processing to apply this. Hey, tip number eight, dynamic background extraction. Uh, Obviously, every program, every astro imaging program has some sort of background extraction. So this tip applies to that as well, but uh, uh, this is an important tip. 
proper background extraction is key to setting up a much easier post-processing experience. Without a generally flat background, even a basic stretch of the data will be difficult or even impossible. Uh, I use a dynamic background extraction process in PixInsight for my images. So for mono, I extract the background separately for each channel. Um, for narrowband, I usually only need to extract the background from the O3 channel. Uh, if I'm ever doing a one-shot color, uh, I'll apply the DBE to the whole integrated RGB image. Uh, DBE should be the second thing you do in your workflow right after cropping. From uh, heavy light pollution, your background uh, might be very bright, so I usually turn the tolerance up to 10 so that my samples don't get rejected. Uh, I usually use subtraction as my correction method and place anywhere between 30 and 80 sample points, depending on the gradient and target. Um, always aim for the background. Uh, don't put samples on stars or the target itself. And make sure you get the samples near the corner as those are usually the most extreme spots in the gradient. So hopefully that uh, tip works for you. Uh, it's vital, it's important to learn, to use it. Uh, each, each image will have uh, a different approach that you might need to take. But generally speaking, uh, what I just described works well for most images for me. So if you're starting this hobby, uh, out from a heavy light pollution zone, try not to be too discouraged. With the right techniques, gear, technology, and effort, it's possible to create some nice astro images, even from a Bortle 8 or 9 sky. Uh, if you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe, or leave me a note in the comments. Perhaps you have some light pollution tips of your own to share. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you next time.